so I'll just um, introduce you to our, 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 our session now and to our panel as well in a minute. Um, but first, I'd just like to welcome you to Open Education Week 2022. Please continue to introduce yourself in the chat from France, Croatia, Denmark, Ireland, across, across the world. And uh, I'll keep an eye on the chat every now and again. And uh, any questions you have as we go along, please put them in the chat or any comments or anything. Use, be part of the conversation. Don't don't hold back. Say whatever you like. And the title of the session today is "Yes, it's open, but is it any good?" And reflections on open reading initiative of scholarly research. And we're going to talk a bit about reading and openness and some um, entanglement of these uh, things and what it might mean to to read well. And we're here uh, thanks to Eden, Eden Digital Learning, European Distance and E-Learning Network, one of the premier professional bodies for um, digital learning professionals in, in Europe. And the other thing to say is, I can move my slides forward. Let's see. Oh, there we go. So Eden Digital Learning has a statement of support you'll have seen about uh, solidarity, support the sovereignty of Ukraine and the condemning the unprovoked, illegal and immoral attack upon the nation of peoples of Ukraine. And it's, it's just, um, it's obviously a very sad, uh, stressful and um, unprecedented time um, at the moment. And <clears throat> our thoughts are with, with people in, in the war, people who are suffering really terribly right now in another part of the world from, from where we are. And it's against this backdrop that we, we, we kind of have that in mind all the time. It has a huge um, effect on us and it is having a huge effect on people. So we just wanna make sure we mention that first and because um, it's always gonna be in, in the back of our minds for, uh, over the next time. Um, so we have an initiative in Dublin City University here in the National Institute for Digital Learning, where I work. My name is Eamon Costello. I, I work here in the university and, um, it is about reading and enhancing our reading. And we have this annual project, uh, led by my colleague, Professor Mark Brown, who will be one of our panel members. And it's about enhancing our own depth of understanding to promote a culture of professional reading amongst not just uh, academic staff, but other categories of staff, support staff and professional services staff, and, and just to, in general, to create this culture of scholarly reading. And also to provide a service to the wider research and professional community. And that's the kind of open aspect of, of this. Um, and this is an article I wrote a long time ago, I'm not pretending the article is any, any good or anything, but I just thought I'd share it because it was published in the Open Learning, the Journal of Open Distance Learning. And it was called, it was about a special issue, opening up education. Um, uh, and well, Eamon, just to let you know, we're not seeing the slides. You're ah. not in presenter mode yet. Ah, is this any good? Yes. Yes, brilliant, thank you. So, oh, my apologies. So we've got, I'll go very quickly. Opening up to open source, looking at how Moodle was adopted in higher education. And this was a bit about opening, opening up uh, ideas of open source, open education and so on. Published in this journal, sponsored by the, the UK um, Open University. And I shared it online and this, this very nice lady who, who I know got back to me said, Eamon, I would love to read your article and it sounds really good, but uh, there's only one problem which is that uh, it's, I'm not able to access it because it's asking me for a lot of money to uh, read your article and I'm not able to do that. And I you know it seems a bit strange because you're talking about all this openness and stuff. So that was a kind of rather chastening experience. Um, uh, and it kind of gave me this awareness that we're in this, I'm in this kind of filter bubble. I arrive on campus in my car, I connect to the university Wi-Fi by my phone. It knows I'm there, I'm geolocated. I have this type of scholarly privilege. I get to my desk and I just have this huge 
wall garden that I'm immersed in of access to literature that is seamlessly because of geolocation that, that I that I can see and access and everything. And that's not the case for everybody who's who's not in, in a university in particular. But the other thing is just because it's open or accessible, does that mean it's any good? Not necessarily. And there's been a lot of this in the pandemic, a lot of paywalls being lowered and things being made available for free and this is kind of kind of a, possibly a gateway drug by publishers and edtech companies um but also just because it's open is it any good and in the manifesto for teaching online and other other sources you could draw on they're questioning this idea of openness as well as a construct and, and it's not just a benign force and uh problematizing this issue somehow and that it 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 prescribes other things and openness depends on closures. So I think that's what we're going to do today. We're going to dig into this idea of openness and talk a bit about that. But also if it's open, it doesn't necessarily mean it's good or anything. But what we have done here is some work on, we do have some things that are good, that are open. And for example, this article is open access. And uh, it's a very nice article. And what I liked about this is it's it's a well paced article it's written with students, which you could see as a kind of open practice it's very inclusive they're they're co authors of this paper. And for me as a reader, what I like about this paper is the pacing of the paper it's got a good cadence it introduces some concepts, for example, uh, student engagement as a construct and active learning and it introduces them in a nice way and then it critiques them and I think that's a nice flow to that and doing that is 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 well done. So there's a lot of rhythm in this paper. I don't know if Professor Gourlay is, is a drummer or anything, but I like the, the pacing of it. Um, and this article is, I'm not sure if this is quite open access actually, but it's another type of open. And I was able to access it on my phone last night when I was making dinner for, for, for kids that weren't going to eat it. So at least it was it was accessible because sometimes openness is there's a kind of purity about some of these things. But um, it, it relates to, for me, a form of open scholarship, and it's about being open about in the kind of sense of open science, about doing open work, work in the open, work with others, uh, being explicit about what you're doing, an entanglement of, of research and practice, and working in huge groups of, of authors, and uh, opening up the boundaries of, of academic publishing, even because it's based on two other studies that all of these um, uh, researchers came together to write about, about COVID, teaching in the age of COVID. I'm going quickly here because I want to get to my, our panelists. And this is a wonderful article about emergency remote teaching in higher education by our, our third panelist, uh, Dr. Melissa Bond. And this is a wonderful uh, piece that synthesizes a lot of other research out there. It's, it's open access in, in a, a platinum open access journal. And one of the conclusions of this was that a lot of the research that was done in the pandemic is emergency research effectively like emergency remote teaching and maybe not necessarily as theoretically well informed as it might be and this article here is is, is an outlier it's not in our, our top reads of the year it's but it's it is an open access article published recently and it links to the last article this is an article by professor mark brown about um the main trends in online learning a helicopter possible view of possible futures and the link with the previous article is it does draw on a sense that there is a big history to online distance education and that history shouldn't or can't be forgotten and the trends that are happening now are to be seen in that context and in particular a trend of openness and this idea of op openness and closures is one of the, the themes called out in this article. So now I'm going to open to our panel and I'm going to very briefly introduce our panel and then I'm going to ask my first question. So we've got Professor Leslie Gurley from University College London Institute of Education, Dr. Melissa Bond from the University College of London also and University uh, of South Africa, of South Australia. Uh, and Professor Peter Jandrick from University of Applied Sciences in Zagreb. And I'm going to give our first question um, to Professor Gurley, and I'm going to ask you, uh, please, Leslie, what was your top read from 2021? A, a very difficult question, is <laughs> an impossible question, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, as thank you. Eamon and organizers for inviting me. This is really interesting. And um, yeah, that was a really difficult question um 
<clears throat> and I almost answered, you know, this, you know, Irving Goffman, you know, from 1950 something, you know, because of, you know, sometimes your top reads are not necessarily the, the latest published uh, work. But obviously, that's not really the question you're asking. So let me just, um, I'm going to put in the chat the link to the paper that I've, I am going to nominate. Um, and it's um, an excellent piece by um, Lena Rahm, whose work I have to say I, I hadn't come across before. It's called Educational Imaginaries, Governance at the Intersection of Technology and Education. And it's, it is open access and it, as I, yes, I think it is. And um, it's in the Journal of Educational Policy. Um, and I really like this because I'm working on the concept of socio-technical imaginaries um, at the moment in my own work. And that's coming out of uh, Sheila Jasanoff's work in science and technology studies. Um, and I thought this paper was really nice because it's it, it's not only theorized, but it's um, developing theory. So um, Ram um, takes the notion of educational imaginaries, sorry, so socio-technical imaginaries, and she um, develops the notion of educational imaginaries. And I think this is, uh, very, very relevant to our, our current situation um, in terms of um, digital education. Um, so yeah, I find it really excellent and I'm, and I'm going to use this in my own work. Um, it's very well theorized. It's um, another, I think, great feature of the paper is I think it's, it's, it's a suitable paper for a reader who does not know anything about this area particularly. It's very clear. But it's widely, um, the citations cut across several different areas, so it's broad and deep, which I think is another um, characteristic of a, of a, of a successful um, theory piece. Um, I won't say spend too long talking because I know we don't have much time, but that, that would be the re some of the reasons that I, I chose this paper. But there's lots of other fantastic papers, so it was a really hard um, choice. So I'll pass to the next person. Yeah, so uh, that's that's wonderful. The, the, the writing clarity and, and broader depth of the citations and how, how they're interwoven the great um, characteristics. And I'll give that same question to 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 Professor Petter Jandrick as well. Maybe you'd like to tell us, Petter, what you, you've already plugged something in the chat there. Well, thank you very much. As, uh, as Leslie already said, uh, First, it's a great privilege to be here. And it's a very hard question indeed. So especially even more so because of, I've, I'm immediately reminded of different genres. So obviously we are talking about academic papers, but then there are books as well. And then there are uh, other things, other uh, formats and genres of writing, which are really, 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 uh, interesting perhaps but not suitable for this for this discussion so what i've chosen is uh, an article which is on your screen at the moment which kind of crosses genres which is really interesting when i saw leslie's paper of choice it made me smile because mine is also about a uh, visions and theorizations and uh, imaginings of something which is not yet there but could be at some point what is interesting about this paper, which is unfortunately not open access, is actually a structure which I find quite unique. So the first author who actually organized the whole paper was expired, inspired by a book by Bill Ayers published a few years ago. And she picked a paragraph in which Bill talks about uh, future schools, about as, yet, about as yet schools. And then she invited uh, people, she put out an open call in which she asked people to send their photographic reactions to this paragraph. So basically the idea was that people responded to this paragraph with a photograph. And then after collecting 10, 12, 15 photos. I'm not sure exactly how many. Uh, the, the lead author invited four theorists of photography to interpret the, pho the photos and to bring, to, to, to 
move away from the visual world to the to the world of theory again and to see what has and to interpret the responses and then finally she managed to get bill Ayers, the guy who wrote the original paragraph who inspired it all to write a postscript and actually say how he feels about this exercise about his own work and i think it's a, i think it's a wonderful it's a wonderful example of a paper which crosses genres crosses uh, it's collectively written it's open in so many senses it's open to the visual is open to it uh, it's open in a sense that it allows for various very different interpretations and for various different interpretations which are uh, told in radically different languages as well so the only way that this paper is not open <laughs> paradoxically is that it's really not open access but in all other ways it's really really very open and this is what i'm this is the way in which i'm trying to probably send my last message for this for this four minutes is that openness has many faces and that being open access doesn't really mean being open. Like for instance, I edit a Springer journal, which has a mixed, mixed uh, access uh, publication mode. So if you work at a rich university, which has an uh, open access uh, contract with Springer, then you, you can publish your papers in open access. But if you work for a poorer institutions, such as mine, which does not have a con an open access contract with Springer, then you publish behind the paywall. And you can say that this opens up opportunities for open access, but then you can also say that this basically creates a, a huge divide between rich and poor universities, between people working at places which can afford open access and people may, uh, working at places which cannot afford open access, meaning that, that basically open access, which is on offer in my journal, is open just in name and it's actually divisive and it's actually the opposite of open in my opinion. Open, open to inequalities, opening to inequalities, very, very interesting. And I think it's a wonderful example of a paper. Um, like, I love this idea of a kind of pop up community of scholarship around a paper, almost that, that this community of, of a paper can be a community of, of its authors and a wonderful example of, of that. Um, thank you for that, Peter. And I'm going to next ask, um, Dr. Melissa Bond about uh, her. Um, what, what, please tell us, Melissa, what, what um, your favorite read of 2021 was, The Impossible Question. Oh, yeah, that is really an impossible. That is, yeah, very much so an impossible question because um, in a lot of the work that I do, I do a lot of uh, evidence synthesis across uh, all different educational levels. And so I, I am engaged in a lot of reading and I found this a really difficult question. And actually the one that stuck in mind was oh, technically something that was published in 2020. Um, and I thought of another one that was published in 2021. So I'm gonna share both in the chat just because. Uh, so this is the first one. And then, and it's ironic what the two of them have in common. So they are both available open access, but they both are, um, centered around the um so the k-12 space or more specifically the the secondary education space and and how um uh and so they actually use both of these articles use um the voice of students themselves so they they include secondary students in the writing process so it's not just about talking about the student experience it's bringing the students into the um, at the writing process so that their voice can also um, can also be heard. So this particular article is by um, a secondary student and she talked about how um, the pandemic affected her specifically and went through you know examples of how it was managed in her in her school within her subjects 
um, how she responded to um, all of the different tweaks that were made during remote learning. Um, and I, yeah, there was just something about it that really resonated with me. And then the, the second one was even more so in that, and I know I'm sorry I picked two, I can't help it. Mm -hmm. um, the second one was even more so, but technically it was published in 2020. And this one was actually um, co-authored between two academics and their um, children. And again, it was about bringing that student voice and co-publishing with them. Um, and it was a really interesting, like autoethnographic take on the pandemic and their lived experience. Um, and it, this particular article, I actually ended up, it, 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 I don't know, it touched me or, or something about it really reached me. And I actually contacted the, the, the academics and I contacted their, their children as well because they were all listed as co-authors. Um, just to say thank you, because it was it was really fascinating to get, I don't know, a different take on um, on their experiences and their opinions and um, what using technology meant for them and, and not just the benefits, but the challenges and the struggles. And I feel that, um, you know, open education should be about hearing the voices of, of some of those people that don't necessarily get to tell their story. And these were two examples of of these students being involved in the academic writing process. And I thought that was fantastic. So they're the two I chose. That is wonderful, Melissa. Thank, thank you so much for that. And I think that's what, what there's a lot of things about that that I could say, but this was my one very brief comment is, I think it's lovely that you contacted the authors say thank you for writing their, the thing. I try to do that sometimes, but it's a beautiful thing. Just really, as an author to get that email from somebody to say that their work is appreciated that beats all of the other extrinsic things you can get and i'm sure that must count as some kind of open open practice or it's something at least it's it's done sort of for for open reasons and without without gain and two great examples there so our next question oh sorry i'll go back there after one more panelist there I'm going to ask Mark about your favorite read of, I mean, you've uh, been spearheading an initiative on this, so you've already had um, some uh, much thinking done in this space, but what was your favorite read of 2021? Well, thanks, Eamon. And yes, this is kind of dear to the heart because um, we have now for six years done this exercise of challenging our own team initially to say what was the best read. And as our panel, fellow panelists have said, this is a hard question. But I actually think it's a really good question at the end of the year for all of us to think about because there is so much that we could read. Um, I put in the chat um, links to my best read and it probably comes as no surprise that it actually also is the number one that we identified in our NIDL general reads on educational technology. Um, EdTech within limits anticipating educational technology in times of environmental crisis. Um, you know, it sort of strikes at how you select, you know, what, you, what really is a good read. And I do like to what I call sort of going vertically or horizontally. So we've got an example of that instead of reading vertically in your own area that you might describe crossing or border crossing, I think someone else said. But in this case, it's hard to go past Neil. Um, I've been reading Neil for a long time. I know Neil very well personally, even right back to when he was in Cardiff. And um, this one really got me thinking. And if there's one thing that I would say that when I'm looking for something that I would say is one of my top reads or good reads, um, getting me to think. And on the one hand, there's been a body of literature for some years that have talked about how um, online distance learning provides um, an environmental option that's much cheaper than bricks and mortar and all the cost and the electricity and everything else that comes with it. Actually, there's a challenge to that when you understand the total cost of ownership. I'm sitting here with a monitor going at the moment. And really, that's the flip side of um, what Neil had to say. It actually starts, firstly, very first line, which grabs you, which is a lesson for writers. Despite climate heating and rising ecological instability, environmental issues feature really in discussions of educational technology. And so it addresses a gap. Um, but what's really challenging is the fact that uh, in the future, with the kind of data centers that we're now seeing, and, and sadly, even you could put it in the context of the Ukraine crisis, 
these centres become um, sites of struggle and conflict and potentially very problematic. And so the costs of ed tech, in inverted commas, may be unsustainable. Certainly got me thinking. I know in my personal um, activity with new tech, I keep a laptop for my last laptop was for six years. I keep a phone for usually about four or five years. Um, so I think it also has uh, a resonance with my own practice, if you like, but a great read. I like the use of, as Leslie was saying earlier in, in a comment on her paper, what I liked about this paper that Mark recommended was the use of citations and the way they were put in. I was like, oh, that's really good. Like citing these, this type of research that I didn't know about and this type of research that I did know about and, and making those connections to them. I think there's a kind of quite an art to that in, in papers, um, but also a very important topic in many other things. So I'd like to now um, uh, return to, to Leslie and ask her, how do you keep up with current literature and how do you, uh, how do you decide what to read? Uh, I just had a bit of a hollow laugh there before I <laughs> unmuted myself because I don't, there's so much out there that the, the whole notion of keeping up is, is in, in itself quite um, problematic. I mean, I think one of the, the, my challenges, I think, is, and I think it's, it's the case for many of us in, in this field, is it's a field, not a discipline, right? Therefore, that it's very interdisciplinary. There's um, many of us present and also, you know, maybe participants listening or other people um, writing in the field are taking um, generatively from, from different subfields and substrands of work. And so I think that's interesting and challenging in order to, um, to enrich the, the work that we do, you know, where it will be as Petter was saying, you know, we don't be simply looking at ed tech journals, we're looking at a range of different theoretical um, resources and um, methodological and um, empirical work from, it, from a range of different areas. So I think, I mean, I tend to, in practical terms, um, I don't know if you want me to say anything about, about this, how I do it, but I mean, basically, um, one really important thing for me is actually currency is really important and seeing what has just come out is really important. But one thing that I, I learned when I wrote my last book was the importance of going right back to the foundational work because so much, and I can see Peter's nodding, I know you, you're very thorough with this as well. So often there's um, constructs which are thrown around in the fields which have lost their original um, meaning they've been sometimes taken out of context that they've changed <clears throat> and that's okay you know that's that's fine too but I think for me the the what's helped me a lot is <coughs> excuse me is trying to be very very clear about exactly what I mean when I'm using certain terminology um, so that means going, very often going back to maybe some you know quite older um, work from uh, and finding out where it came from um, looking at books sometimes that are print even or you might struggle to, to access it. And again, this comes back to the question of privileged access, how, how extensive your library access is and so on. And I realise that, that that's very unevenly um, spread. But yeah, that would be it. So there's keeping up, but there's also the delving into the, the, the deeper roots of, um, of, of, of where things come from. I mean, I was actually, I went off Twitter for a few years because I just found it... I was looking at it too much, it was taking up too much time. And I just recently rejoined it about three weeks ago. So I thought I've got to, because that's another thing. You do get, keep up with the brand new things quite often coming up on social media. So I do a bit of that, but it's not my main approach. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but um, yeah, breadth across different sources, but also depth in terms of um, going right back and really doing the, the deep reading that, that lies behind some of the more recent work. I think that's, that's kind of shows in your writing and it's, it's a, it's, um, it's a great, um, a great reminder that there's a, there's a depth of literature out there and we, we've got to keep drawing on that and keep going back to that and 
interrogating our original ideas and saying, well, what was that about? Or, or finding what, what, what people have said about this. And it also puts everything in context, I think, going back to, to the past as well. And it gives more, uh, a bigger scope sometimes. So, um, Petter, I'll ask you the same, same question. Please. Well, I, well, I'm, how do I, I'll start with the second question. How do I decide what to read? My answer is, well, I don't decide what to read. Uh, being an academic editor, editing a journal, editing a book series, editing quite a few books per year myself, I get things in my inbox pretty much every morning. So, and there's so much reading, I would say that I probably spend between four and six hours every day editing other people's texts for every working day in average in a year. So I work with other, on other people's texts all the time. That's, that's, that's what I've decided to do in this period of life. And for me, I think, so I don't really decide what to read. What I decide to do is I've created a certain community around me. So there's a, I know what type of papers will come into the journal. I can roughly expect what kind of chapters will come into different books. And reading all those things, I, well, this is the first thing I'm doing. I'm working on those texts. Of course, those texts, especially the good ones, will usually have a lot of uh, references, of course, to some other works. And I do actually check references and I never stop just at the text I'm reading. I'm always trying to, and I really get inspired by some, so I really, I really found many, many, useful and excellent sources by following the thread of citations. So somebody cites somebody and then I check this somebody and then this somebody cited somebody else. And in three or four or five steps, you can actually find, I mean, make a really nice journey uh, from, from the most recent stuff, as Leslie said, to really classics and to, to those foundational, to those foundational works in really in really any field so i think and and of course there's also the social media and everything but we live in the age when there's simply too much stuff being published and there's so much stuff being published that i really think that the only i mean the the approach that i'm taking is that i don't really care too much about ways of finding the sources what i'm trying to do i'm trying to develop an interesting community around me mm. and then this community actually does the job for me and i'm i'm doing and i'm also giving back of course with my papers with my and everything so it goes it goes it goes both directions and i also want to say one more thing which is i've talked to many academics privately in pubs, in water cooler discussions, as they call them. And many people complain about the same things that I think are not so, so often uh, out in the open. And this is that working with texts, and all of us working with texts, even you don't need to be an editor in order to, if you're an academic, you are bound to spend hours and hours per day, week or month working on your or other people's texts. And working on texts, I've got this big problem that actually reading does not relax me anymore. So when I was doing other types of jobs, then I would come home and I would take a book because it was a way of relaxing. But now after five, six, seven, eight hours of working on texts, I just cannot re relax with texts anymore which unfortunately brings me to the situation that my reading outside of work is very limited and because and i don't really know how to how to how to fix this problem but i know that i've learned so much from the classics i've learned so much from literature i've learned so much from novels from poems from all these other beautiful genres 
which are have nothing to do with the academic work and somehow they have everything to do with the academic work at the same time. So my my thinking is that while we focus to our academic stuff, I think we should also pay a lot of attention to other things such as really, you know, the, the art of writing and the, 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 the uh, to those completely other genres which are perhaps not related to our work at all. We'll, the next question will be precisely on, on the art of writing. We'll, 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 we'll come back to this one. Uh, and those couple of things I took from, from your response there, Petter, and one was that lovely idea of intertextuality and this idea that the text can open other open into other texts for you and lead you down these wonderful pathways. And the other about texts as something that is parts of communities and reading is part of, it has this community about it, you, you mentioned that a couple of times, you mentioned the people, and there is a part of the openness of, of, of reading practices about sharing. It's lovely to share with people to say, oh, have you heard of this person? Or, you know, someone will send me a PDF and we're starting a new project at the moment about hacker ha some hacking and rewilding um, concepts in it. And I was reading back some of the original literature I, I, would, I knew before about hackers and that kind of, the philosophy of that and this idea of sharing communities built around um, gift giving and so on. So some wonderful things there in, in all of that. And I'm going to ask uh, Melissa as well. Uh, what about your? What about you? How, how do you? What are you? What are your strategies for reading? Do you need? Do you have the same problems as Petter? Do you have too much reading to do all the time? Just coming <laughs> at you through these systematic literature reviews, or how do you? Decide? Sometimes I do feel that way. <laughs> Sometimes I do, but um. But I, I also am a big fan of, of community building and, um, and using those communities to help inform my, my reading. Um, I, I have to admit, I do love Twitter and uh, I probably don't spend enough time on it, in my opinion. <laughs> but um, I do, I, I'm, oh gosh, I'm a big fan. And not just from a, um, building a professional, you know, learning network, building um, community, but yeah, you just get so many great ideas from people through there um, in terms of in terms of not just the newest literature, but also like you said, you know, coming across some of those gems that you might have missed or you or you want to revisit um, uh, coming through. I also really like to um, use other platforms like ResearchGate or Google Scholar um, to uh, sometimes curate my my reading um, so sometimes I might sign up for a you know a, an alert to let me know if someone um, has uh, cited a particular work or someone has uh, published something new um, if they're uh, you know uh, an academic or a researcher that I, I really enjoy reading then um, sometimes they can send me off into all sorts of uh, different myriad ways um, I think the other influence I have as you mentioned you know the systematic reviews I really enjoy reading them um, and I can I find they can be quite an interesting source of of new things to read whether or not their current depends on their um, obviously what what they included within the review and the, in terms of when things were published but that can be a really interesting way of um, of keeping track of, of some of these newer newer developments um, coming coming out um, and, and certainly openness does play a role in, in what I read because I, I do find that, you know, it, obviously like anyone, if you find it easy to, to get, easy to, to download, you know, whether it's on a repository somewhere or you've got open access to it through the platform, well, you, of course you're going to uh, be able to read that first because you've got your instant gratification as well. Um, and if it's behind a paywall, then, mm, you know, I'll park it but I've got a massive list of things I'd love to read that I think, oh, I'll come back to that later when I can get access to it. And it's really true that I do. So um, certainly open access does play a role for that. But yeah, um, and the other thing, the other thing I do tend to do now with my um, systematic reviews is I like to create um, openly accessible databases of the studies in my reviews so that other people uh, are able to at least access those and they they're able to filter them uh, by you know maybe by um, study level or by um, uh, topic or, or whatever that they, they're particularly looking for and then that I'm hoping that kind of helps them you know keep track of things that they might be interested in reading so um, yeah that's that's probably my strategies 
Wonderful. And as a, as a lovely note to finish on there, as, as, as a kind of this idea of reading and you're creating, curating for others as well. It's like, and, and like the, the practice that a lot of you, come up, you up, Petter talked about, of, about communities uh, for, for readers and so on. And, and that lovely idea of, of keeping, paying it forward with the literature. Um, so Mark, how do you keep up to date with current literature and how do you decide what to read and does open X, openness play any role? Well, open, openness certainly does play a role um, just because of the sheer quantity of literature. You can't leave this to pure chance. So I kind of think you have to think about who you're going to read, um, what as in what publications that you might single out. Um, by that, I mean what journals in particular, or there may be particular uh, websites from government reports and so forth, uh, where you're going to go to, in other words, and you just can't um, cover everything. So you need to have a filter and understand what the questions and what your interests are. And hence, what's a good read for me isn't going to be a good read for others necessarily. Um, I do subscribe to several hundred journal alerts. Um, does mean I get a lot of traffic, email, but um, I'm always looking for that new idea, something that's different. Uh, Melissa's mentioned Twitter. So yes, I couldn't underestimate uh, what I discover new in the literature via Twitter. Uh, and the other part to that is when I find something perhaps I haven't read before, it's the references to that work um, that are also, it's actually the first thing I go to typically in an article after I've read the abstract is I go and look at the references because that might give me something else to look at, how the arguments positions being constructed. Um, another part is actually, though I probably don't do, I know I don't do as much as I should, which is reviewing articles prior to publication. One of the benefits of peer review is you get to see the work before others do. Um, I know I had the privilege to review Martin Weller's forthcoming book, and there's a couple of um, concepts or um, links to literature that I wasn't aware of that I'm now using. Uh, PhDs are another great source, um, do a reasonable number of examinations, and so you'd like to think a PhD student is right at the edge of the, what they're researching, so that's a gift when I'm examining or even supervising to have someone else finding material. Um, and then a culture of sharing, I think, is really important. I, I like to think that I certainly model that whenever I find a, a publication. I recently had one on crowdsourcing research um, or funding research through crowdsourcing and shared that with the vice president of, our, of research at DCU as an example. But the one thing I do think you have to also think about is not what you find and how you stay up to date. You then have to decide, are you going to fast read or slow read it? And my concern is too much of what we do is just grazing today. And I know this from the exercise where we identify our top reads each year. And also I'm doing a, a bit of work at the moment for the OECD that's forced me to really slow read some pieces that I may have glanced through previously, but it's perhaps what Melissa also benefits from, far for me to put words in your mouth, Melissa, but from doing systematic or literature reviews, you really have to get into the depth of the article. What I personally do, last comment, is I just have a commitment to read one article a day. Um, I have a sad life, which that extends typically to reading one on a Saturday and Sunday as well. So that's 365 articles a year if I keep up that commitment. But when you think about the wealth of literature, I'd hate you could, someone could probably quantify that. I suspect it's less than two or three percent of what's published. So um, those are my strategies. That's wonderful, Mark. Thank you for all that. And um, it depends how you circumscribe, what, what, how you define what's published, because it may be a, 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 a smaller fraction, uh, uh, possibly. Um, and there is a couple of other contributors. Uh, I think Petter talked about this as well, the, the tsunami of, 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 of things that have been published out there. And there was a really lovely article there about a few years ago about unsighted uh, papers in K-12, I think, was that, you might remember the name of that one, Mark, but um, it they went back and they looked at these papers that had never been cited. And I just thought it was a really nice article for lots of reasons. Methodologically, it was really good, but um, conceptually it was brilliant for just, it, it just gave a great sense as well that there's just so much research out there 
there's actually really good research that's been done that's never been picked up and it's as good as the stuff that's been picked up and it gives some kind of solace or some kind of perspective in this huge widening sky of of publication um and this this notion of transience and, and time and, and so on the temporal element to it so um our next question i think we've touched this is I think a really important and interesting question. We've touched on this already lots of times, and I'm going to ask um, our, our try and get our, our our community online as well to please start contributing on directly on the question. So I'm going to put this out to everyone, including in the chat. And what is the relationship between reading and writing for you? And I guess you could unpack this question in different ways. I'm looking forward to to hear what people think. And I'm just minded when when Mark mentioned that. Ed Tech Within Limits paper by, by Neil Selwyn. And I remember reading that article and I was trying to write something at the time. And sometimes I forget how to like write sentences or something. I'm like, I, I just can't even remember how to write a sentence anymore. How, what does an article look like or something? And then I go, right, I read an article and I go, this is really good, but it's not rocket science. I could write something like this. You put this here, you put this here, you cite these types of things here. This is how many hundred words you need here. You need this here and this here. And it gives you kind of, um, it gets you back this 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 notion, the, the kind of readerly and writerly text is, is one of the, the, the things they talk about. Slight digression there from me. So I'm just gonna uh, uh, ask Leslie about what what is the relationship for you between between reading and writing, and how does that what's this what's that translation for you look like, please? Yeah, it's a really good question. <clears throat> um, I mean, my work is is these days entirely um, theoretical, so reading and writing are very strongly connected because I'm not working with empirical data. Um, so uh, you know the, the kind of material, as it were, that that I'm working with and thinking with is always textual in some shape or form. I mean, in, pra in practical terms, actually, that I've got quite a specific approach to this. Um, whatever I'm writing, I open a Word document, and this includes a book as well. I, would do, I use one document only, and I don't take notes into different documents. Um, because I, I just find it not useful for me at all. I think it's confusing. I get version problems. I just open a document <clears throat> and I start. And I write in full sentences, always. I never make notes of any kind at all. It doesn't mean it's the last version, but I'll write the, the most, um, the, the, the fullest kind of, you know, closest to the final version that I can as my first, um, you know, first draft as it were, you know, so I try to make that fairly developed. This, this relates to reading. <clears throat> because another thing that I do is um, I read and write together at the same time, always. So it's very unusual for me to just read. Um, with a book, rather than a longer than an article, I might, I might sit and read it without writing at the same time. But if, if I'm only going to use little bits of it, then I might not find myself writing as I'm reading. But if I do that, then I use post-it notes and I write on them and I put that, them all over the book. So these are my kind of ways of kind of forming a bridge between the, the reading text and, the, and my own writing. Um, so that's one thing that, that causes it to be very intertwined. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I mean, in terms of if, I, if I'm stuck, <clears throat> if, I, if I can't think what to write next or what the direction of my argument, then reading obviously is, is the key. And I'll sit and read something and try and pick up a thread. And I often think of the whole thing as being like, you know, there's lots of metaphors that we use, but the one that works best for me is, we can talk about voices and so on, but for me, it's always the idea of, of, of weaving threads and some of the, or fabrics and, or something like that. And sometimes the big, thick, strong thread that is going to weave all the way through a book, for example, or, or an article. And that's the, almost the kind of center of it yeah but i don't i would also try to find other little smaller threads that i can weave in and out of the the text as well and that's where the reading comes from another thing just to finish on this is um i really like um catherine hales's work on reading and um, she talks about three types of reading one of them is hyper reading which is the kind of jumping through links on online that kind of meandering wayfaring sort of reading 
And I think that's very different, obviously, from sitting open in a book and reading it from cover to cover, but I think that's incredibly important as well. And the, what really helped me, I was lucky enough to have a sabbatical a couple of years ago, and what really, really helped me um, was for the, really, I think almost for the first time in my academic career, I could do the really slow scholarship and read things properly, you know, not quote mining, not kind of dipping in and out, but doing slow scholarship. And I think that's incredibly important. It's very, it's a privilege to be able to do it. But I think that's what distinguishes some of the best work that I read is when I can see that the person has done that. So I think reading is absolutely foundational. And a lot of the, I think we're talking about there's so much stuff out there. And sometimes a lot of it is, it's, the data set is really nice and everything's great, but it's just not got the depth because the reading has, has, is lacking. And I think that, like, you know, academics are always saying, I've got no time to write, but really the reading is the first casualty, not, I think, not writing. And I think that's where we really struggle to find enough time to do the reading um, properly. So I'll, I'll stop there because you've got me on one of my, my kind of <laughs> favourite topics. I'll, I'll, I won't say any more about that just now. Uh, no, that's so wonderful. We could definitely uh, hear, listen to you talk all day about that. That's brilliant. Some wonderful things in there, like reading to unlock writing when, when you're when you're stuck. We we <coughs> thread back in. Very thanks for sharing your practice of writing and that that um, dividing that up into ways with the post-its and and the other things is very interesting. Separating out those types of writing and so on. And then reading as the first casualty of 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 the of the of the time crunch and everything else. So, um, and Petter, I'd like to ask you about the the relationship between reading and writing for you, please. Okay, if you could share some thoughts on that for, for us. Well, for me, both reading and writing are really forms of thinking. They're of course different forms of thinking, but they are definitely forms of thinking. So when I read, I don't just taking the information which is contained within the text. When I read, I connect this to my experiences, to my thoughts, to my ideas, to my circumstances. And what I do really is that I always reinterpret re what I'm reading for myself. And this is a creative act, it's not just an act of accepting something that's written, it's also an act of uh, interpretation and an act of thinking and reading can be uh, a creative act as well. And I think that it's really important to emphasize. Now writing, writing for me has become something that uh, has become so deeply ingrained in my in my uh, identity that I just, when I want to think something through, I write about it. And sometimes it doesn't really have to be academic at all. So sometimes I'm, I'm just, I just have a certain question that I need to resolve, whatever it is, whether it's a personal thing in my life or whatever, and I will write about it. Often those texts will remain unpublished and they will be, the only person who will see them will be myself. But the idea is that writing for me is a form of purification, a form of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of uh, cleaning up my ideas, a form of making me understand myself. And obviously those two things are, are extremely connected. I'll, I'll tell you an anecdote, which I think is really, it's really interesting. I, my partner would tell me, go buy this, 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 and this to the shop. And I would go to the shop and I would remember less than half. And then she would tell me, okay, you need to buy this, 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 and this. And I would say, wait, let me just make a list. So she would tell me what to do. And I would write down a list of things, what I, what I, what I had to buy. But then of course I forgot the list at home. So I came to the shop and I was without the list again. But because I've put down those things on the paper, I actually remembered everything that I've written down, although I don't, didn't have the paper on me and I actually bought everything. Meaning that the text can be useful even though you don't have it on yourself, even though it doesn't exist in a way writing and reading for me are a form of thinking and the form of understanding the world 
which goes way beyond just uh, the question whether something will be published, whether something will end up as a good text. I mean, the shopping list is, is a typical example. The only purpose of this shopping list was not to have a piece of paper with the list of items. The purpose of this shopping list really was to systematize things in my head, in my mind. So when I come to the shop, I can actually understand, remember what I needed to buy. Of course, this whole thing happened on accident. My point is that there are many forms of reading, there are many forms of writing, but I always, but I do, believe, I mean, they are not, they cannot be separate from each other. We cannot really, I mean, of course, everybody who reads needs to write and vice versa. But for me, they're just manifestations of thinking. And before I became an academic author, I used to be, well, not really a professional musician, but I would play a lot of music and I did make my living with music at a certain point of, in time. And it doesn't need to be reading and writing. For instance, for musicians, it can be music. For somebody else, it can be something else. So I don't think that we should uh, monopolize this and say reading and writing is everything. Reading and writing is really means a lot to me, but somebody else can have a completely different way of perceiving, understanding and processing the world, be it music, be it visual arts, be it whatever. And I think that all those ways of understanding and processing and thinking about living with the world and living through the world are equally valuable and equally important. My personal way in these years is reading and writing, but for somebody else, it could be many different things. It's also more efficient because if you're gonna write a song about bananas and milk and Weetabix and all these things that you need from the shop, that's gonna take a long time. So, although it'd probably be very memorable as well. And that's wonderful, uh, Petter. Thank you for sharing that as so much there. Uh, I love the idea of reading as creative as creative practice, quite a kind of uh, a huge statement. And of course, that is the case because reading, you're deciding what to read. As, as Mark has mentioned in the chat, sometimes you have this urge to respond to the text as you're reading. You start you start arguing with the text or responding to it, or you start agreeing with it. So you have all these um, reactions and there is this there is this creativity when we're reading. And then you said some very beautiful things like uh, writing as purification and as making me understand myself. And, and I love that idea of this. Um, we are, it is part of an acting and it's something core to, to, to our identity as, as, as scholars um, that we're writing. And this is, this is just part of our, our life and our, our life, our life process and so on. So Melissa, I would like to ask you about, about reading and writing for you. Sure. I did, uh, I did pop a couple of things in the chat because uh, I wasn't sure on timing, but um, I, uh, yeah, I, to be honest, I had no idea how to write. Um, I'm st I mean, technically, I'm still an early career researcher. And um, when I first uh, started doing my PhD, I'd, I'd never published before and, and had no idea how to approach this thing called scholarly writing. Um, and I know I bang on about it all the time, but uh, one of the best ways that I've I, I learned how to write, honestly, was through reading and undertaking systematic reviews and just getting a volume of, of, of information and ideas around me. And, and I am someone who likes to be fairly, um, I guess, systematic about how I do it. And, and I go through and I'll read as widely as possible until I reach that saturation point. And then, you know, as I'm going, I'll be thinking about and constructing things in my head. And I, I do take a lot of written notes and um, and uh, and things along the way, and and I am a bit old school. I do prefer to see things, which is you know not necessarily sustainable, but I do like to see see things in you know on paper and, and in front of me, or or at least on the screen in front of me, uh, and um, yeah, try to collate these ideas and get them all sorted. And then after I've gone through this beautiful volume of information, that's when I I'm really synthesizing and I'm really putting down my own thoughts and and having those discussions with it. Um, yeah, but but uh, again, like you like you've already said, you know, without the reading, I wouldn't be able to do the writing. So, um, and also using it to understand how different how different um, journal uh, journals want you know want the writing to to be. There are certain mm -hmm. things we may need to consider in terms of scholarly writing and, and how we how we approach certain um, uh, um, outlets 
in terms of, of how we're writing. So that's also something to consider. So reading things that have come before in those sorts of spaces was also helpful for me in terms of understanding how I should be formatting um, what I'm putting down. Yeah. Exactly. You're, you're thinking about the, the, the reader. You're imagining who the reader is. They're the reader of the journal. And you've got this kind of layered approach almost because if you're a writer and you're submitting to a journal, for example, you're thinking about the reader. You're also thinking about the editor and you're also thinking about the reviewer. And they, these could be slightly different people. And to some degree, you're kind of writing for these audiences in different ways. But ultimately, to get to the reader and and, um, and it's it's that's a, a great a, a great way of, of thinking about reading. And a very practical and useful way of reading is is about this is what this journal community this is what they look like. This is what they're writing. This is what they're expecting. This is the, the genre I need to be um, getting into. Um, so, and I think this, um, the other idea of um, reading and writing that's coming across as well is there's a lot about um, writing and there's a sense that you have to right and there's something coming true that i don't know whether i um another i could put this question to, to mark in a second maybe but a lot of our panelists have said that we because uh we read and then you write and so on or there's some interconnection between these two things but there's also perhaps some kind of danger or some kind of sweet spot or when do we stop reading and start writing or do we just for are we going to forever read or get stuck in the reading or something there's a great novel by a guy vs napal he's he's written some amazing he's one of the most amazing novelists um post-colonial novelists and he wrote this one a house for mr biswas and it was about it was semi-autobiographical it was essentially about him uh, a very short funny novel that's that's worth a read it's very well written it's beautifully written but there's a, a lead character in the story and he's going around his village and he's known as a brilliant intellectual and he's this huge weight of expectation on him from the community and he always believes he's going to write a book but he it's almost like he's never going to do it and he always oh i'm going to write this book i got this book in me you know and everyone's like oh he's got the book in him uh, and it's obviously there's a kind of a, a resonance because it's actually about the author vs napal himself and his deep kind of talent, but also the kind of desire and longing to, to, to write really the, the kind of deep wound of, of all of that. So Mark, what, what do you think about, maybe I'll just give you this, this kind of angle of this question, because you've, you've responded in the chat on some of your thoughts about the, the relationship with these things. How do you know when to stop reading and to start writing? Or what was the interface between those two, those two things? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, firstly, I'd completely concur around um, reading and writing being about thinking. It's a cognitive process. Your question about when do you know when to write is distinct from reading. Um, like Leslie, I, I don't really separate the two, um, although probably we all, if we're honest, have times where we're more productive than other times. I mean, time itself is a variable. So sometimes I need that inspiration. I need that trigger. So that's what the reading sometimes does. And anything that I consider that I'm going to take that time to slow read, you will typically find in my writing. Um, the article that you shared at the outset, um, you'll see me referencing that work from Neil Selwyn, along with lots of other work. I think Leslie's work um, also appears in there. So they're just intertwined. But what I did put in the chat box, conscious of time, I was doing that, folks, I'll just pick out one thing, which is at a meta level, as I said there, um, I'm reading in a way that I never used to when I was, shall we say, a more new and emerging scholar, in that I'm looking at how things are constructed not necessarily the body of the content, but the way things are put together. Um, Leslie mentioned metaphors before. I like myself to use metaphors to try and create things that paint pictures in the mind, that push your mind in different ways. So um, for me, that's a really valuable part of, write, of reading is seeing how others go about writing and how can I borrow, steal, adapt any of those um, strategies and elements of writing from someone else. And actually there are a handful, very small number of people who I read for that very purpose. Wonderful. 
thank you, Mark. Um, and this the great, great connection with um, uh, the idea of, of thinking and and of 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 writing as thinking and clarifying thought. And you don't really know something until you try and write it down and explain it to someone. That's that's the pain, the frightful and painful part. What the hell was this thing I thought was nice and easy in my head when I was talking to myself? Um, and some great um, things in the chat. And if anyone would like to ask our panelists a question, please, because that's kind of our what we what we have planned to talk through today. And we've been a bit over an hour, so it's it's been a, a wonderful discussion. Um, but I'd just like to turn it over to our audience and ask them if they have any questions for our panelists, please. And I hope all our, our audience are inspired to go and start writing and write something amazing by the end of this week. Just put a few words down every day and uh, Thank you, Sladja. Citation impact role of H index. Well, that is those are those are um, if you want to write for those things, those are kind of um, what is the, the role of do you read? Do you read? Do you read those? Um, I'm not sure what the question is. Maybe the question is, um, do people think it's important to read research that has been highly cited or how do you read research that's going to be highly? How do you write research that's going to be highly cited? I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, I mean, if I could just make one other contribution where you're multitasking, looking at the chat box. I thought um, Leslie did this in, in one of her articles. Um, that was one reason it really resonated. But Melissa shared two real gems with us with um, extending the voice, given I was talking about voice, um, extending the voice to those who might not normally be heard, um, students, um, children in, in one case. Uh, we're currently finishing off our literature review on the concept of student readiness during um, the COVID pandemic. And what we see is just a mountain of surveys of the student experience, but none of those really meet the criteria for what I consider to be giving a vehicle for student voice. So there's just a couple of publications, um, and Melissa, you introduced me to a new one, thanks um, the value of today's session where that voice is being given to people in a different format in a way that can be much more powerful. So I think that's a really important aspect to writing, finding that voice and extending voice. Yeah, it actually, I'm um, sorry to butt in uh, without putting my hand up there. <laughs> um, it actually, you know, those kinds of articles, they made me think about my own students as well. Um, and am I giving them a voice in some of the work that I'm doing? Um, and sort of inspired me to maybe think, well, maybe I should be doing a little bit more with my undergrads, for example, and maybe giving them an opportunity to also start um, start uh, dipping their toes in, in the research and writing world. So, yeah. Anyway, sorry, Peter. No, no, it's fine. Thank you very much. It's really interesting. I think that, uh, well, I, I, was, I was inspired by Mars' question about voice a bit earlier. I think that finding our own voice as writers, as authors, as human beings, is hugely important. And I'm, I've been, for the past few years, I've been become aware of that I've got something called the voice, then I've tried to shape it in this or that direction. And when you become self-conscious about own voice and own style of writing and own, own style of, then it's really actually a very difficult thing to manage, especially because it develops all the time. It's never the same. You cannot say I've developed my voice. I mean, you can, but then very soon you become very boring and very repetitive. So really voice uh, is something that de develops and evolves all the time, which is really interesting. And it's a permanent battle, it's a permanent struggle really to find own voice and improve own voice and see what to do with own voice. And as editor, it's also a really an art to, to, to uh, be able to accommodate uh, voices of others while packing them into a pre-packaged a, 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 a schemes on, which are unfortunately required by academic articles. And this is just, I know that I'm taking a lot of time, but this is just one minute to answer to Slajana. Uh, citations and roles of age index and so on 
Well, it's uh, there's nothing wrong with it if you want to play this game, but it's uh, I it's I think it's a very restrictive way of looking at writing, very restrictive way of looking at reading, where things are mechanized, they become increasingly similar, they follow those very strict rules, all those impact factors, a age index indices, and so on. What they basically do they make ideas and things, in my opinion, dull and uninteresting. And so, so, and it's a part of my personal voice is I don't really care about citations and indexes and I simply don't, uh, I refuse to write in a way which would abide to their rules. But they're just me. Thank you, Peter. That Leslie, you're gonna come in. Oh, there. Well, if, you've, if there's time, I mean, just um, yeah, too, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, agree with everything um, that's been said, and uh, I think yeah, H index and stuff. I mean, you know, I, I've got a very you know very critical stance towards anything to do with any form of audit of um, academic work, quantification of that sort. Um, However, you do want you, you want put people to read what you've written. You know that's that's what what is a bit more important. So I think one thing I I, I did less of recent years is um, book chapters, and it's and it's unfortunate, but I think very often they just don't get picked up to the same extent. I will do them here and there, but you know it's not something that I, I do as much um, anymore because I want you know and and I've, the hardback books is that's an ongoing kind of. Um, conversation with publishers about that as well because obviously I, I would rather that they were open access or at least paperback first but that's a struggle with, with within academic publishing to to get your your work out quickly and not have expensive hardback that hardly anyone's going to look at right and especially in, I think in, in, in our field where it's so fast moving so mm -hmm. I feel quite conflicted but about that but, but I'm, I'm now currently writing another hardback right so I'm still in that 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 space but I, I wish I wish there was a way of it being coming out more quickly than that. The other thing I wanted to say as well, just about the writing process, is um, a really basic thing that I've I've started to do, or I've, I've been doing for a few years now, is um, in terms of voice, um, confidence, writer's block, all of that. I think what I do is really simple, a bit like Mark's saying about he reads a, an article every day. I sit down and decide I'm going to write, um, depending on how much time I've got, either two thousand words or a thousand words. It's usually two thousand, um, and I don't. I just don't stop until I've got the two thousand words on the page, and that is really not at all. That doesn't sound creative, or um, you know, it's very unromantic. It's a very kind of mechanical approach. But actually, that rule has served me incredibly well because it means that I do keep going. You know, I, I'm not allowed to stop until I've got that that number of words on um, written, and it has to be proper text as well, not not notes, and that is. Um, a piece of advice that I give to my students now as well, just, just hack on. And the ideas will come, you've got to trust to keep going because that's something I've really, another just final point really quickly is, I, I don't know what I'm gonna say when I am start writing something, right? Now, nah, Peter's doing that. I have no idea really <laughs> what it's gonna be about. I mean, I sort of know a little yeah. bit and I get started and I might meander along and, it, it, it emerges, right? It emerges, so you've got to trust the process and, and just keep going. I think that's incredibly important and, and it's quite scary. I'm at that stage right now with the book I'm writing now that I've, I'm at that kind of high wire moment where I don't really know what it's gonna be, and, but I just keep going anyway. So that's just my advice is, is, is don't try to think you've got to have the whole thing in your head first before you start writing. You just have to write and, and the ideas will come. The writing will, will take you somewhere that that's lovely uh, beautiful sentiment i i think uh, thanks for sharing that better that's a that's some homework for us maybe maybe a good note to end on we have a, a reading fresh off fresh off the off the press and actually there was an interesting thing with, that, that, as you mentioned there about we could go on and talk for hours but fast scholarship but trying to get things out that'll be read and trying to get trying to publish and get things out in a fast changing and moving world and environment, but also having the appreciation to take time 
for ourselves to read and give ourselves, I think Peter's talking about solitude in this article, I think the beauty of reading is you're given time to yourself. It's something you do for yourself. And it's like, it's like an act of intimacy that you just curl up with a book or an article and you're reading and you, you, that's, that's time for you. It's, it's you and the text and the author or whatever, and you're, you're reconnecting in that way. And I also totally agree with Petter about this idea of voice and that it can be actually sometimes negative to focus too much on this or that, you know, we are not a stable, there is no stable self or personality. We have these sub personalities and components of ourselves that are changing that come to the fore at certain times. And the voice, it could be very boring if we're writing the same thing all the time, every, every day, or, and maybe not. Some people can do that. That's it's people are different. And there's some people you, you, you pick up their article 10 years later, you know, it's going to be the same article they've written 10 years ago and the same about the same thing. Um, the faces change. Uh, so I'm rambling a bit, so it's definitely time to really just on behalf of everybody to thanks to, to Eden and I'll put us up a slide to our conference, but our, um, put up a slide to the Eden conference coming up, um, next and just, but to deeply thank our, our hosts, Eden, um, and Robert and everyone who helped set up the session and just a huge thanks and maybe clap or put some smileys and, and thank yous in, in the, in the chat for our, our wonderful, uh, uh, panel members who who shared their time so openly on in open open education week and gave us so much food for thought and so much inspiration to fuel our imaginations and fuel up our writing practices so we can go off and both consume some really good readings and then write up a storm of of uh, scholarly work so thank you everyone hi everyone